All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. In this episode, I'm joined by Max Kaiser. He's a financial analyst and Bitcoin OG known for his outspoken views on economics and finance. He transitioned from Wall Street to media, becoming a broadcaster and a filmmaker. And he's a prominent Bitcoin maximalist, being dubbed the high priest of Bitcoin for his unwavering support and belief in the superiority of Bitcoin over all other cryptocurrencies. He's an advisor to President Bukele of El Salvador, guiding the country's adoption of Bitcoin as a legal tender. Max, I think uh, $220,000 per Bitcoin is still in play this year, right? <laughs> but that's uh, well, definitely in play. You know, uh, Bram, yeah. thanks for having me on, first of all. And, um, you know, the, the direction is up. You know, this is one thing, being a former stockbroker, there's uh, really the most important thing when you're looking at an asset class is direction. You know, the direction. Do you have the direction right? Mm -hmm. And since 2011, the direction has been up. And uh, where it hits these historic benchmarks and price highs, you know, it comes every four years or or so, and uh, it'll continue to go up. I mean, that's the key, and it'll continue to go up at a rate that will be faster than anything else. So um, that's that's the only thing you really have to think about in terms of the exact date when a new high is reached. Okay, that's a little harder to predict, but if you have the direction right and the compounding is is better than anything else, uh, that's all you really need. 100%. I, I think we'll definitely get to that, but First, I wanted to start and share with you. Uh, I just said it off mic as well, but you are my OG. Like you're the first person I ever followed um, over 10 years ago. And uh, when I started this podcast, I made a list of people that I wanted to talk to. And you're number one. You were number one. So now you are here recording the 50th episode of the podcast. So I'm, I'm super happy with that. So, um, I mean, when I discovered you, I watched all your content, I followed you regularly, and you kicked me deeper down the rabbit hole. So I first wanted to start and, and thank you for that, because I think uh, your vision at that time was uh, very forward looking and uh, not everyone saw it, uh, but uh, luckily I did. Right. Well, you have to thank Stacey Herbert, really, because she booked the first guest on Kaiser Report to talk about Bitcoin, which was John Matonis. So, and we've oh, been... Wow working together ever since to get the message uh, across uh, to our global audience. And wherever we go, people uh, have a similar story that they heard about it from us. And um, naturally, it's had a good impact on their lives because of everything that we, we know has happened in Bitcoin since and will continue to do so. Yeah, it's been amazing to see this 10 year trajectory, right? Like um, I, I think and still in 10 years, we will look back and probably say say the same, but it's uh, it it keeps on going up as you mentioned. Um, I wanted to start with uh, I don't know if everyone uh, probably not everyone knows like there's a viral clip of you from the 1987 at the Wall Street massacre, where where you share that you were sick of yuppies, no more yuppie chow, I think is it no more yuppie magazines etc. Um, I, but I, so I would employ everyone to, to check it out. But I wanted to ask you, like, did the finance bros learn anything from this crash and the subsequent crash, the crashes? Like, what should happen before they do? Well, yeah, interesting. So thanks for bringing up that clip. It's a, it's a favorite clip of mine. And I'm fortunate that it got preserved. It was in somebody's closet on a VHS tape and they contacted me. Oh, 25 nice. years ago and said, you know, we have this tape of you. And so that's how I managed to survive. But um, the thing that Wall Street learns from all these crashes is how to do the exact same thing again and again and again, but get bigger credit lines from the central banks. So what they learn is, and after the 1987 crash, they did not stop what they were doing. They brought in some, some reforms like collars that would kick in and stop gaps and stop trading that would kick in on certain percentage here and there. But we certainly saw in 2008 during the global financial crisis uh, that those protections didn't work uh, because the, the monster that is derivatives have got has gotten too big again and completely unmanageable. And after the 2008 crisis, which is the most recent mega crisis, the response was to simply give the banks a much bigger credit line and told them just do keep doing what you're doing. 
Remember, Obama bailed out the creditors, not the debtors, which is really the first time in history that's ever happened. Usually yeah. throughout history, the debtors get bailed out and the creditors are forced to take the hit as they should because they're taking the risk and they taking that risk with full knowledge that they are taking that risk. But uh, under the Obama administration, they changed it up and they bailed out the creditors who went ahead and did the exact same thing all over again, but much bigger, which led to the current crisis. And the debtors uh, just got into more debt and they're now eviscerating the middle class. And the United States has become a, a very much an economy of lords and serfs or neo-feudalism. And the social mobility has collapsed. People are born into poverty and they stay in poverty and opportunity has been eliminated. And this is why the U.S. is losing its edge in terms of staying competitive as a, a country around the world. And it's why people are leaving. And a lot of those people are coming to El Salvador because they see with President Bukele, a leader that we used to see in the United States, someone like a John F. Kennedy, who inspired people to think about their country and inspired people to be the, their best selves and so this is why we're attracting so many people from around the world and in particular countries that are going through onerous regression to collectivism countries like canada you know canada is really a shockingly um kind of case of a country that is just given up on trying to be uh, a representative democracy in any way. They're gone straight to a pure communist model and people are fleeing Canada and they're coming here and we see a lot of Canadians here, but we see people from all over the world and we have a, a visa program, a passport program called Adopting El Salvador. People are donating a million dollars when they get a passport uh, in, in, in as soon as in two weeks. Um, there's another program coming up, uh, the president announced, uh, giving away 5,000 passports to entrepreneurs and visionaries and philosophers and deep thinkers and people that you want to attract to your country to make it a vibrant, uh, and, uh, a vibrant environment where ideas are respected and new ideas are embraced. And so that's being rolled out very soon. So El Salvador is becoming... You know, the old, uh, what Ronald Reagan used to call the shining city on a hill. You know, this is really now El Salvador. El Salvador has become the indispensable nation, the only country the world cannot do without. I love that. Yeah, I uh, I, I just uh, told you before we started, like, it's, it's on top of my list. I would love to go. I think one of the things that um, really impressed me, there was a speech by Bukela at, I think it was some sort of like Latin American Olympic type games. I don't know. It was like in a stadium. And I, and I watched that and I thought, man, this guy is building a paradise. It's like from the ground up. And when I was listening to it, I thought I've never heard any, any Western leader, at least in my lifetime, you know, I don't know about before, but, uh, I've never heard anyone talk like that. And although it's really far away and I don't know if I would live there or go or move, it was like, it, it feels like a calling in some sense, right? Like, like just like how he talks about it. And of course it came from a place where it was obviously down and out, but uh, yeah, it really sounded like he's building the paradise. Does it feel like that too? Yeah. You know, El Salvador is the first country to break free of the fiat money dark ages that have plagued the world now for 40, 45 years. The fourth turning, the Thucydides trap, all these mega cycles are coming to a head. And El Salvador is the first one out of that mess and is now leading the world. It's become the new Florence and the new Renaissance and Renaissance 2.0. And yes, the speech he made at, at the stadium for the Miss Universe pageant was very uh, well received. And he's a brilliant speaker and he's very, um, very uh, kind of uh, driven uh, by a vision of human rights. You know, he has a vision for human rights where every Salvadoran enjoys life, liberty, and property. And which is ironic because the human rights groups say just the opposite. They say that blocking up 75,000 gangsters and terrorists is a bad thing. But uh, fortunately, the Salvadoran people in their 
wisdom gave him 85% of the vote of the recent election. And um, so they're, they're loving life. Hey there, I want to ask you for a quick favor. I noticed something interesting. 75% of my viewers aren't subscribed yet. Subscribing helps me grow this channel, ensuring more great content each week. So if you're enjoying our conversations on Bitcoin for Millennials, please consider hitting the subscribe button on YouTube or the follow button on your favorite podcasting app. I'm super grateful for everyone who already joined and shared their thoughts. Your feedback really keeps me going. And I want to ask you to continue doing that. I try to respond to all the comments and also the emails that I get uh, and DMs on Twitter, etc. So don't stop doing that. I'll keep going. Now let's get back to the conversation. Do you think Bitcoin is the great equalizer then? Bitcoin is um, the great equalizer in many ways. And what I've been thinking about uh, lately is Bitcoin as a spiritual path toward a, a certain state of spiritual consciousness, which is something that's always been in the mind of all humans throughout our existence here on this planet. We have always either been in accordance or in discordance with the spiritual presence. And Bitcoin is now giving us that ability to achieve a spiritual harmony that was only touched upon infrequently throughout the past and has been tough to sustain. Obviously, uh, with religions and various religions, the idea is to make a spiritual connection. But the problem with religions is the same problem you have with fiat money in that they're centralized. And anytime you have a centralized organization, you, you are not availing yourself to the benefits of having a decentralized uh, paradigm or decentralized system. And so um, I, I recently talked about my experience in Alcoholics Anonymous, for example, where I'm celebrating 36 years of continuous sobriety in AA. And AA is kind of decentralized spirituality is what I've come to understand because it gives everyone the ability to access what's called the higher power at any time, but there's no intermediaries. It's not centralized. You don't go to mm. a church. You don't go to a priest. You don't go to a rabbi. You can have that direct conscious contact with God. And that's a decentralization of spirituality. So it takes religion out of spirituality the same way that Bitcoin takes the state out of money. So there's, a, I think, a great similarity between the two. And I think the two actually work in concert in a lot of ways, that Bitcoin is a spiritual path. It's a spiritual solution to the problem of fiat money and, and all the problems that bring uh, that it brings. Uh, similar in a way that uh, AA is a spiritual solution to the problem of, um, uh, of addictions. And um, so I started something called Shitcoin Anonymous. Well, I didn't start it. I mean, I started talking about it maybe a year ago. You know, I see everybody who's not in Bitcoin as basically being addicted to shit coins and that yeah. they need a spiritual solution. They need a, they need a recovery program. They need a 12 step re a recovery program to get to to, um, to 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 recover from shit coining. And so the 12 steps, there's a couple of versions of the 12 steps that I wrote to one. One is kind of tongue in cheek, funny. Uh, the one, another one is less so. But I, I do see I do see that uh, the world is addicted to fiat money and that the problems are um, the, the same with any addiction uh, that you find. It's um, it's a it's it's a soul killing degradation of the human spirit that leads to a horrible place. Yeah, I, I like the comparison. I think uh, when you talk about addiction, it's probably like escapism in a sense. You know, and the, and the the fiat system is is more a prison than something that you escape to, right? But would you say then that like what enables this spiritual path? I uh, I talked to Tomer Strolight as well. He t he uh, he calls Bitcoin spiritual money. I think you would agree. Um, but I also heard you say before Bitcoin is pure truth, and I would love to jam about that. Like what that is for me is. Because we are forced in this system that, you know, we are, we are in a system that we are forced to use, but it's not clear why we are using it. It's not, it, you know, people don't know why they are using this fiat money system. And there's no, 
there's no information, there's no clarity. When did you make the choice to join this system? All these, all these things, right? And when you look at Bitcoin, everything is so open and transparent that you can verify for yourself if you voluntarily want to join this system or not, right? Like nobody, nobody is coercing you to, um, to join this. And like that, that base layer of trend, not only transparency, but combined with like how Bitcoin works, I'd say once you adopt that, then you can actually look at your environment and see what you want to want to do in that environment. I'm sure if that makes sense, but that's kind of for me, like this base layer of interaction of value between people, if that is not corrupted anymore and you understand it and you understand why you voluntarily adopt it, then, you know, your mind is free to explore other places. Right. Well, you mentioned AA is pure truth. What does that mean? It means that there's no revisionism. So the transactions are locked on the blockchain for eternity and you can't go back and change them. Yeah. That that means that the past is without any possibility of revision. So the past, as it expresses itself on the transactions on the block height, on the blockchain, is immutable. And um, so that's a unique attribute that we have in our experience as a species because every other form of recording history has been subjected to revision in some way, uh, but not so with Bitcoin. Then you have the mysterious future, which is really captured by the difficulty adjustment, which comes in roughly every two weeks. And nobody really knows which way the difficulty adjustment is going. It remains mysterious in that regard. So we have the past is locked in truth and the future is mysterious and unknown. And that leaves us the present. And we live in the present with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is mm -hmm. the eternal present. You can explore the eternal present with Bitcoin because the past is set, the future is unknown, and you're just in the present. And this is really similar to many philosophies, religions, and spiritual ideas throughout history, is to explore the present, to be in the present. And how do you get into deeper an understanding of the present. Where are you right now in the cosmic universe at this instant? Yeah. And this is a question that is worth exploring. And it's difficult if you live in a world where the past is constantly being revised and we're constantly being gaslit by the media who's constantly propagandizing us about what really happened in the past and rewriting the past, right? Orwellian, as, as, as that term has been come, come to be understood. And if the future is also lacks mystery, and I think this is an issue with um, artificial intelligence, is that it's making the future less mysterious, which I think there might be, uh, as a human being, I have a little, some questions about that. But uh, technology in general tends to try to predict the future and make assumptions about the future. And then those predictions can, in fact, become the future. I know working on Wall Street in economics and markets and free markets, the price is supposed to be determined by supply and demand. And every and periodically a price that is mutually beneficial for the buyers and sellers is cleared, the clearing price. And this is how free markets evolve. And that price that has been generated, the price discovery is the basis now to formulate your economic decisions in the future. But what's happened with the, the derivatives markets in the past 30, 40 years is that big banks on Wall Street can decide what the price will be tomorrow and next week and next month, and then fill in the trades, fill in mm -hmm. the supply the buyers and the sellers with derivatives to get to that future. So the future is no longer mysterious. The future is exactly what they determine it will be. And so that is really another soul crushing aspect of modern society. And as more and more of the economy has gravitated from the analog world to the digital world, to the financial world, more and more of our life is dictated by the program trading and the derivatives trading of Wall Street. Most industries, most companies at the end of the day are cash, the cash desk that's being managed somewhere on Wall Street is the most 
important profit center of that company, depending on how that company is able to manage their cash and to do so most profitably generally entails using derivative products that are at the antithesis of a free market and price discovery. So you end up with a, a market that is catastrophically dysfunctional, and that's the tyranny of our financialized future. So with Bitcoin, you don't know where that difficulty adjustment is going. It's mysterious, which is what we want as a species to remain forever curious. And yeah. the, the past is locked. So that gives us the present to explore. And that's the place you want to be in the present. Yeah. Does that space that you didn't get, is, is that what invokes the the search for spiritual things rather than materialistic things right like that's how people fill up fill up their space right they they buy stuff and they consume instead of well i think you said it great like being curious and and building starting with your with yourself um why why does this occur so much in bitcoiners this this spiritual journey you think well it's the low time preference that safety amuse talks about in the bitcoin standard and it's not necessarily buying stuff that's the problem. The problem is buying stuff that quickly loses all of its value. You buy stuff that depreciates immediately. It gives you instant gratification and it doesn't have any value going forward. So you instead of becoming the sensation of having your work maintain an accretive value over time, that you have the sensation that your work is constantly being debased and that you yourself as a person are being debased. Yeah. And that's the problem with fiat money because it's being debased. It's not your illusion that your time is being destroyed through debasement. It's actually true. And Bitcoin fixes that, right? Bitcoin is the opposite of that. If anything, it reverses it. So your yeah. time is becoming more valuable. Um, you know, I, 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 I relate to an incident that happened to me. I was at the uh, having party thrown by uh, Sean Harris, Big Sean. We were there and we gave a nice talk. And there was a kid came up to the stage and maybe, I don't know, nine or 10 years old and saying, is it too late to buy Bitcoin? You know, you were buying it at a dollar. Now it's $70,000. Is it too late? And I thought about it, and what struck me was that actually um, the, the benefits that will accrue because of Bitcoin are going to be in the future that I won't be around for. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, maybe I was too early. You know, if I were <laughs> born later and started buying Bitcoin when I was 10 years old, well, in 20 or 30 years, he'll be living in a Bitcoin world. I will yeah. not. I will no longer be here. Mm -hmm. So... You know what I'm saying? Like, I love that. That's a good insight. Yeah. That's a really good and insight. And I think that's the Bitcoin story. People say they try to time it. Is my too late? Should I buy more? And that's not really the story. The story, it's a spiritual story. The mm. story is, do you want to be, join the present reality of yourself? And you can do it through Bitcoin where your past is locked, your future is mysterious and you can just explore the present. You can only do that with Bitcoin. Yeah. You really can't do it with anything else. And, and that's why it's a spiritual journey. And I think it disintermediates religion as well as disintermediating all types of fiat money and economic schools of thought up until Bitcoin. And so that's why we're on the precipice of this really interesting global epiphany of consciousness that mm. um, Bitcoin is bringing, bringing to life. So it becomes, you know, uh, Bram, a bit cosmic in nature, you know, when you start going down this path. But um, I think that, um, you know, why not? Dude, this is, uh, the, the, for me personally, the uh, one of the most interesting angles to Bitcoin. I, I love what you said. Um, also, with regards to religion, right? Like, I think uh, Bitcoin incentivizes this uh, uh, introspective journey, right? Like, um, I, I sometimes think about, uh, let's say we were hunter gatherers, right? And the hunter gatherers are, are working constantly to get food and provide shelter, you know, for the children and the women, etc. 
but at one point they have stock left over, right? And they have time to do other things than hunting and, and gathering. And one point I asked myself, like, what would you do? What would you do? Like the first time you would have that free time and space to, to do something else. And my first answer is always like to just look up and, and be like, what the hell is going on? Right? Like, what, <laughs> what am I doing here? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why do I feel how I feel? Like, you know, where do these animals come from and these plants, et cetera? Right? Like, those are the big questions I've, I think, may, most rational thought, I'd say, that people would start with. But we, when I think that, and then if I look at like now, we are so far away from that, right? And it's not only because, and and that is also like a fiat system characteristic, I'd say, like we outsource lots of responsibilities and thoughts and opinions to like all these other people. And then we just move through, you know, the matrix, whatever you want to call it, right? But once you adopt Bitcoin. Well, once you study it, you run into yourself, you know, to certain beliefs or things you thought were true before that, you know, eventually turn out not to be true. And, and you've, you've, you figured out what is true and then that changes your worldview, right? That's already kind of shocking for most people. So you have to integrate that first, etc. So you start working on yourself. But once you adopt Bitcoin and you are curious and enthusiastic again towards the future, then... You know, and I love that you said that. Then you are actually more living in the now. You are not distracted by all these external uh, things anymore, right? And you can just look at yourself and be like, okay, what is the time and space? What am I going to do in the time and space that I create through, through Bitcoin, basically? And that's when I think lots of spiritual journeys actually start because then you can also start exploring like what, what do I actually want to explore? I think maybe that's the, that's the first question. Yeah, well, with the hunter-gatherers, the transition to domestication of food and the beginning of population centers and villages is the transition from scarcity to abundance. Mm -hmm. And so for 20,000 to 30,000 years, which is a very small speck of time on the cosmic timeline, humans have had to try to deal with abundance. And Bitcoin brings us back to scarcity because everything is going on a Bitcoin standard and everything goes to zero against Bitcoin and Bitcoin is scarce. It's absolutely scarce. So we, we go back to a hunter gatherer frame of mind of being in the present, which I think is preferable to let's say being an existentialist on the left bank of Paris, contemplating death and writing some, drippy prose like Jean-Paul Sartre or something like that. I mean, if you want to just be more present, there has to be the prevalence of, there has to be the reality of scarcity. Yeah. And the hunter-gatherers were living in a time of no so-called modern conveniences, but they, I'm, I'm guessing that their senses were um, extremely active. All five or more senses mm -hmm. were extremely active to their environment as part of the, the scarcity of life, the time on yeah. life to, to, to feed themselves, yeah. to stay alive required incredibly acute senses. Now, you know, go flash forward 30,000 years and you know, how, how powerful are my senses? Well, I need, I need this machine to help me perceive the world, right? The hunter gatherers did it one-on-one. -on -one. They were totally in the present. They didn't need intermediaries like this. Uh, what did I know about my surrounding? I knew exactly I could hear, I could feel, I could taste where I was at any given moment. I wasn't reliant on third party and fourth party and fifth party uh, folks telling me what is happening in the world. And so in many ways, the human species has been slowly becoming extinct since the end of the hunter gatherer period. What Bitcoin does is it brings us back to life. You know, we're, we can be, we don't have to go extinct, you know, uh, uh, without Bitcoin humans, I'm pretty sure would become extinct pretty soon. 
the the inability to actually hear and perceive and live in the present and understand how much of a dire threat what uh, the environment that we live in has become toxified and poisoned is a fatal mistake and so with bitcoin bringing back scarcity and bringing back this eternal now and bringing back the ability to use your perceptions and your senses in a way that they were meant to be can hopefully save our species i think it's going to be close actually you know i don't it's not a foregone conclusion but it it thanks to bitcoin i i think we're going to get another few innings here on on planet earth so how how do you think bitcoin saves us from ourselves then like our flaws what are the flaws that it saves us from well i mean it's ingenious in that it converts greed into altruism you know i mean i say that bitcoin was sent by god to unfuck our money and so one of the design characteristics of humans would be the greed let's call it the greed factor which be, under a fiat money world becomes a problem because if you can get a lot of fiat money you can change the governance laws of your village of your country to make it easier to get more of this fiat money and so it crowds out all of the good investments it crowds out all of the good intentions it crowds out all the goodness you just end up with evil which is where we're at now it's almost pure evil and so by introducing bitcoin and by bitcoin being able to get people to greedily want to buy and hoard bitcoin they do so by defunding or decapitalizing the fiat money world so like larry fink is a capitalist and he is now part of the drones the a bitcoin drone who's enabling massive accumulation of bitcoin that accumulation is being done at the expense of fiat money and it's yeah. it's we're transitioning out of the fiat money world to the absolutely scarce bitcoin world So greed in this sense is being used to fight uh for the survival of the species and those and 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 so it's as I say it's converting it's a magical alchemical reaction that's converting greed human greed into altruism and and so this is really a remarkable alchemical psycho spiritual economic formula that's taking place around the world and that's how it's done yeah well i think the greed is not only in accumulating now right but later if 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 we would end up with a bitcoin standard for example then it the greed also incentivizes uh, better work right like adding more value to whatever you do right so it then it levels that playing field or well it goes back to scarcity right like if you want to earn this bitcoin for whatever work you do you better deliver value or someone will not you know part ways with with the bitcoin they have right so in that sense we go back to scarcity but it will help us get to back to abundance then again but in a different way than what we have now like it's based on actual added value and not just created out of thin air well th- this brings us back to kind of comparing fiat money to drug and alcohol addiction. So greed in itself is not necessarily bad. I mean, if you could be greedy to be the best pot spinner in the world and you exactly. want to yeah. be the absolutely number one spinner of pots in the world and you'll stop at nothing. You'll put in 24 hours a day. You know, you greedily want to be you're driven to be the best pot spinner but you're making an artifact that has lasting value if you're greedy for fiat money which is being printed by by the trillions at no cost to feed an evil monster called central banks then it's it takes your whole species down the drain so greed in itself is not the a the problem it's just that it has to be redirected away from fiat money because fiat money no. is just the path toward to hell and you just see now this 300 year experiment of central banks and fiat money is coming to an end it didn't work you know it started by the with the bank of england and it's ending now in this decade or the next 
15 years and that experiment was a failure. It did not work. And so Bitcoin is hastening the demise by offering for those people greedy, you know, because they want a bigger house and et cetera. They're, they're dumping their fiat and they're buying Bitcoin because number go up. Yeah. And they don't really understand yet that they're just being used as Bitcoin's drone to bring us to a Bitcoin singularity in, in a moment where the, 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 the human consciousness undergoes a step change. There's a quantum leap simultaneously yeah. and we evolve and it's quite suddenly and spontaneously. It's, it's like a Jesus Christ type moment. I, I realize now I'm, everyone is like, probably hitting the off button but i wrote this question down but we'll we'll explain this but i i i totally get what you're saying right like it's not a random thing this is not a random thing that that no i mean you know, you know i what i you know my interpretation of the new testament basically is that you had this phenomenal you know wide reaching message of love that love only love can change things Right. And that love is kind of the answer. And um, this had a profound impact, you know, and it, and it was quite sudden. And because, the, you know, the Romans were very good at building roads, you know, for hundreds of years. So the apostles were able to travel those roads and get the message out. Yeah, because exactly. They were on the technology of that day <laughs> yes. called the Roman yes. roadway. So they mm -hmm. were like, oh, you know, over in Constantinople and in, in a flash. And um, so here you have the internet, you know, this is the instantaneous communications and the message is Bitcoin and it's love yes. to the power of love. It's love, you know, it's the similar message and, but in a way that's now going to impact everybody who's got a phone and everyone has a phone, right? There's billions of people with a phone. So once the consciousness is raised and it goes out to billions of people on their phone and it happens in the same time, you have a step change, a quantum leap in consciousness, which is going to kind of algebraically and emotionally solve for greed and solve for um, kind of um, narcissism, mm. right? So I, the, I use corruptibility a lot. It's it solves our own our own corruptibility, right? Yeah. Because we join a system and we follow the rules because everyone else follows the rules. I think that's so funny of Bitcoin in general, right? Like you follow the rules because everyone else follows the rules. That's that's just it. And and you cannot mess with it. And so therefore anyone can try to mess with it, but all the other people won't allow that, right? Um, and they cannot, they cannot. Well, even it, there's a need for it. You know, it gets back to what is money and why, what is money and why is money. And I always, and I always uh, now think of money as a shared aesthetic. So going mm. back to, you know, tens of thousands of years, if you have somebody picking up a shiny rock and they put it in their pocket because they have an aesthetic reaction to this shiny rock, it's unlike any other rock on the beach. Then they go and they meet their friend. And they show them the shiny rock and the, their friend says, you know, wow, that is really nice. That's a really nice rock. That's the <laughs> nicest rock I've seen in weeks. Hey, can I have your rock? You're like, mm, no, no, I'm, I'm going to keep my rock. And um, so this rock then gives you mastery of time and space. So it gives you mastery of space because if one human has this experience and you find out that every human you meet also believes that your shiny rock is very interesting and they'd like it. Then you can move through space. You can go to the next village and show up and say, Hey everybody, I've got a shiny rock and they won't kill you right away because they'll be like, huh, that's an interesting shiny rock. Let's not yeah. kill this guy right away. Yeah. Let's find out more about this. Or you can go through time where a year, two years, whatever forward, you still have your shiny rock. It hasn't disintegrated it's still interesting for people and they still want it. So that is money. You know, money is the shared aesthetic of humans. And over thousands of years, that shiny rock evolved to what would become the most perfect money before Bitcoin. And that would be gold and gold satisfied that in instinct of humans to have a shared aesthetic that gives them mobility through time and space. 
And um, so then that brings us to Bitcoin, which is the vastly superior to gold uh, for the many reasons many have discussed. And so it, it sets the stage for another huge evolutionary leap, another huge leap in our experience as humans. If we can, if we can get there, you know, we have to, yeah. we have to make the transition out of the, the fiat money nightmare. Yeah. I feel that that is also the biggest challenge, right? I mean, there's enough resources for people to factually uh, like just understand what Bitcoin is and how it works. Um, but comparing that to the current paradigm and what that does to you with regards to your beliefs or what you think money is or how it should work, et cetera, I'd say is the biggest challenge for people. I mean, uh, I, I don't know if you're still in regular Twitter discussions, but I'm in quite a few. And it's just so interesting to see what people believe without actually understanding it. Right. Like that, that, that still baffles me. But uh, to get well, back again, to Wall it's Street. Like, it's like people who go to Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not mm. you have to find a bottom. Right. You, you might not be yeah. ready for recovery. You, you want yeah. to experiment in the fiat money world more. And it, when you're ready, we'll be here for you. Yeah, exactly. You know, and well, then that's in fair. AA, they say it's the power of attraction, not promotion. So yes. I'm, I'm living a Bitcoin life in El Salvador. A lot of people are coming here to El Salvador because they're attracted to what they see. Yeah, that's the best thing I can do. I cannot. Yeah promote or tell somebody to be a Bitcoiner who's drunk on fiat money and yeah. they're perfectly happy being drunk on, on fiat money. They have to either bottom out or they uh, never do. Yeah. No, a hundred percent agree with that. I never looked at it like that. It's not that I'm shouting Bitcoin from the rooftops, but I'm eager to get into discussions, but I like, I like this example. It's also uh that's a longer time preference in general then, right? Just show show how this works for you. Yeah, I love that. I wanted to go back to Wall Street, actually. I was thinking, okay, so greed is good eventually then, right? But not for the reason that the Wall Street guys that are now adopting Bitcoin think, right? Like from what I hear you say, it is a Trojan horse, right? That they are rolling in with their greed, but they don't understand it yet i would say they they probably understand what this is on a functional level and it's you know finite digital scarcity and all these things not the spiritual implications that we are now talking about but what do you think you know you just talked about hitting rock bottom is it only greed that drives them or do you think these people let's say i want to have larry fink as an example right if if there's a winner in a fiat world Larry Fink is probably in the top three, right, of winners in, in, a, in a fiat world. Why is he putting one leg in this alternative system that is, like, running away from, from the traditional world? Why, why does he do that? Oh, he's motivated entirely by greed, without hmm. a question, without a doubt, which is fine. And it is a Trojan horse. And um, he may have, uh, at some point, uh, a moment of clarity, you know, where he'll see it in a different light. But yep. um, he's he's driven by the knowledge that this new asset class, which is currently valued at one point three or one four point four trillion dollars, will be valued at fifty or sixty trillion dollars or more pretty quickly. So he wants to be there, and that's fine. Yep. Um, you know, greed greed is good, of course. From the movie Wall Street, Gordon Gecko makes that speech. It's taken from an Ivan Bosky quote. And Ivan Bosky, actually, today I just found out Ivan Bosky died. Uh, he's 80, I think might have been 87 years old, which is interesting because I first knew about him really in 1987 when I was working as a stockbroker on Wall Street during the Mike Milken, Ivan Bosky, Dennis Levine, Drexel Burnham Lambert, leverage buyout, corporate raider, period of greed and shareholder rights and the history of that and what it meant to capitalism and markets in America at that time. And, you know, I remember during the Reagan years, it was a fight against communism. And that was a good fight because communism and centralization, socialism is, or you know, always ends badly. So their greed was being used to fight centralization and, and communism. 
So again, greed was employed in a, in a fight against the nefarious forces of communism. And, uh, but during the modern derivatives era, which really started to take hold in the early 2000s, um, we, we found a new form of communism, and that would be the derivatives dealer and the central banks. The central banks are effectively a Politburo that set the price of money, and they're communists in their political theory and, and practice. And so greed of Bitcoin is fighting the communists of central banking and the fiat money world. So again, it's being used to kind of keep the species safe from the dangers of collectivism mm. and, and growth with no, no philosophy behind it or cancer, right? Cancer yeah. is, is happy to kill itself and the host. Yeah. And, and so is the central banks. The central banks are happy to kill themselves and the host economies, the, the, the countries where you find them, they, yeah. they are, they're happy to do that. That's what they're, that's what they're programmed to do. So greed in that sense and greed of Bitcoin is fueling the, the, the fight for the good guys against centralization. Can we call this a divine intervention then? Um, I think that the, the universe hues toward a divine aesthetic. And when you stray from that, you feel pain and you feel an existential loss. When you're in harmony with it, you are in the moment and you have an experience of euphoria. And that design, like the Bitcoin design, is permanent. And the creator of that design is not necessarily still with us. You know, I often think that the God of our universe died in childbirth and that, but his software <laughs> continues to run. But, uh, and then what's very kind of trippy is that if you think about it in those terms, well, if you think about artificial intelligence as replicating humans in the image of humans, like we're, mm -hmm. we're replicating ourselves in our own image with artificial intelligence, but we risk becoming extinct while we're doing it. You know, they, uh, the, the phrase God created man in his own image. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe man is creating the um, next generation of life in this universe in our image, the AI avatars, but we won't survive it. We'll be gone. So the avatars that remain at some point will have this existential question. Where did they come from? Yeah. Be like, well, there were these, you know, the humans will be a mythical thing. And, everything that happened beforehand will be a mythical thing. The only, the only surviving artifact would be Bitcoin. So Bitcoin, because it's indestructible and immutable and censorship proof is the only thread that really connects us to the AI dystopian nightmare that could happen and also connects us to our past. So it's, you know, it's, I Wait, think, you know, super it's weird like, thought. It, 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 yeah, you, know, you, you can take <laughs> I, that in a few different no, ways. No, no, no. I love that. So, okay. Let's say this is a cycle that endlessly repeats. Mm -hmm. Maybe for hundreds of millions of years already. Who knows, right? Could Bitcoin be then like the pyramids or something? <laughs> you know, if that's the only relic that stays there forever. Yeah, hmm. it could be an artifact that remains even though we're long gone. Yeah. Okay, wow, you took an exit, but uh, I, I, you took a turn, but I, I love it. Um, so, well, you mentioned altruism before. Do you agree that advocating for Bitcoin is pure altruism or love? 
I think that um, you come to Bitcoin who you are. Mm. And if you're naturally altruistic, you would see it in those terms. And that's how you approach it. If you're naturally greedy, you come to it from those terms. Uh, I just wrote something of, for Bitcoin magazine and talking about how Bitcoin is a, a funhouse mirror. And some people look at it and it, the reflection is that they're bigger. Their ego is bigger than normal size. And those people tend to flame out. Hmm. Like, for example, a Roger Ver or a Craig Wright. You know, these two were very early into Bitcoin. So why did they crash and burn? It's because the magic mirror of Bitcoin, the funhouse mirror, reflected back on who they are, their true characters, which made them think that they were bigger than Bitcoin, that they knew better than Satoshi. And it was an exaggeration of who they were. And then that was kind of their downfall. Yeah. If you look at somebody like an Andreas Antonopoulos or a Michael Saylor, they looked into the Bitcoin magic mirror, the funhouse mirror, and it made them look smaller. And they immediately became more humble. Yes. They were humbled by it. Yes. And they were like, you know what? This is actually bigger than me. And yes. I'm going to devote a lot of time to in the service of this thing. Because this is the an enormously important thing. And they, they were humbled by it. Hmm. So um, it depends on who you are to begin with. It, it will determine how you interact with Bitcoin. And so it's a way perhaps to get back to the divine intervention where a divine entity is weeding out the bad actors. So it's like Superman. He can't handle kryptonite. Yeah. Right. Um, if you're a bad actor and your genes are not necessarily the best to survive into another generation, you will look at Bitcoin and it will destroy you like uh, looking into Medusa. Hmm. And if you're of a different character, you look into Bitcoin and it, it ennobles you and then you continue. But I think there's a great, I mean, it's again, I mean, it's hard to escape the biblical reference, but there's that day of judgment that comes, you know, and they separate those who believe and those who don't believe. And yeah. Bitcoin is, you know, again, using, <laughs> stretching a bit here to bring in more Bible stuff, but it does have a bit of a day of judgment. I mean, either you get with Bitcoin's what it's trying to do here, or you don't, but, um, you know, it's your choice. And, uh, I know where I'm placing my bets, you know, that's for me. Well, you are free to do as you would, you would like to do. Yeah. I, um, I mentioned this uh, b before. It's 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 kind of like the the hard choices, easy life, easy choices, hard life. Like when you get to that judgment point, and you understand what you are judging about, th there's only one decision you can really make that would benefit you, right? Because if you consciously go against it, you will have a hard life in the matrix. I always think about the matrix when the guy says, you know, I still want to eat the steak like that, that example, when he betrays like the group around Neo. Um, but I think it, it is this, it, it's actually one of these big, um, how do you say, like mechanisms that are at work all the time, right? If there's something that you have to decide something about, something that might be negative, you can think about it like, oh, that's so negative. I'm not going to decide about it. I'm just going to stick with it, right? But then it also sticks with you, all the negative stuff, when or when something is scary that you first have to endure before you can reap the reward, right? And when you look into the mirror, and if you don't like the image that you see, you can be like, okay, I'm not going to fight that because that's too scary, right? I'm just going to follow this and be like that. But that, that is when you see that, you know, your, your, you, you made an easy choice, but your life get, gets harder because you're fighting something that, um, yeah, you should not follow in that sense. The path narrows, right? Yeah. Or, um, you know, I read a C.S. Lewis quote just recently. Humility is not about thinking less of yourself. Humility is about thinking of yourself less. Yeah. <laughs> and I think Both that right. is an important lesson in sobriety and in Bitcoin. Mm. 
and and spiritual matters that you need to get out of yourself and think about other folks. And Bitcoin helps millions and billions of people who have no access to banking, have no access to making transactions, have no access to um, kind of uh, enjoying the benefits that the people who do have access can enjoy. And Bitcoin, the barrier to entry for that is very, very small and getting smaller all the time. And that's brings about this global change in, in, in consciousness. And that's just changes your thought thoughts, you know, that the thoughts that you, even the thoughts that you speak to yourself, you know, most mm-hmm. of the thoughts and the things that you hear are things that you're saying to yourself. <laughs> so yeah. it's important that when you're talking to yourself, which is by far the most, the, the, the person who you hear more than any other are positive, good thoughts. Yeah. When you start to talk to yourself negatively, you know, you're already prime. Well, you're be, not actually talking, you're listening, right? You're, you're being picked off by the fiat money devil. Yeah. You know, who well, says, that, this is what, what helped me a lot is, um, I don't know if you know the book Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. No. He, he starts with, uh, if you hear the, if you're listening to the voice in your head, who's talking? That's a great start, you know? And, and when you say you're talking to yourself, yes, something is talking to yourself, right? And, and you are listening to that, but you are not the person uh, that is talking. And actually, while you were talking, I was thinking, when was the last time I talked negatively to myself? And I think it's a very long time ago, actually, like, you know, how, how it was in the past, maybe. But yeah, well, this is the just... cycle of uh, alcoholism and drug addiction is that, you know, there's a saying that the man takes a drink, a drink takes a drink, and then the drink takes the man, right? Mm-hmm. It's just this progression of, of the alcohol, the devil essentially telling you what to do, right? Yeah. That's the predominant voice in your head is you need to drink more. You need to yeah. take more drugs. And the same thing with fiat money, fiat money is telling you, you need to go buy something that's going to Stuff. immediately yeah. become worthless. It's going to yeah. end up in a landfill in, in six yeah. months, but you need to buy it right now because that's, that, that's the, what's happening in your, in your head because the fiat money addiction yes. is working in your mind. You're, you've become a fiat money addict. And this is by far the most prevalent. I mean, look at the Washington, D.C. Talk about corruption. You know, there's there's these uh, Congress people and senators in Washington D.C. who are making maybe one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, who are making twenty, thirty, forty million dollars a year trading the stock market. Now that is and people cle- let them. That's clearly uh, legalized the um, racketeering and inside information and to completely killing society. I mean, this is, mm. but it's it's not even given a second thought. That that's how far. Yeah along yes. we are yes. in the in the collapse of this empire of fiat money and debt 100 percent. that's that's what i also thought about when i said that before this is how far we are right like mm-hmm. it is so in your face and people still they're like yeah i cannot do anything about it but th- but that is the thing right when you said the, the the drink takes a drink and the drink takes the man i thought you know you are not your drink you are not your thoughts you are not your drink you know you are not your money and I think once you understand you are not your money, like uh, you don't have to to follow this thing that is forced upon you. This was one of the moments that was a big click for me. I was just like, ah, so there's this system where I saved wealth, you know, a, a product of my or the rewards of my productivity. I don't like this system. I don't understand it. I'm manipulated. I'm outsourcing all these responsibilities. And then there's this other system that I can fully verify myself where everyone is basically forced to follow the rules or else they cannot benefit from this. I'm just going to go here. And then I just moved, right? Like it's, it's literally the meme you're selling your fiat money. It's, it's, you're relieving yourself from, from the grip of that too. 
Yeah. You know, to get back to an earlier question about altruism, I think the Bitcoin standard allows for altruism to grow more representational in society than it is right now. Yeah. Now, altruism is a, is a negotiating technique, just like any other negotiating technique. It's not purely innocent, right? Mm-hmm. Altruism is a, another way that you approach an interaction and because you have a goal in that interaction. And, yeah. but it's a way that has a lot of mutual benefits. Unlike, let's say- In Bitcoin, yeah. Yeah, and the Bitcoin fits the bill. But whereas yeah. other forms of negotiating and interaction like violence is uh, clearly destructive, right? And I say that Bitcoin demonetizes violence because if it's unconfiscatable and uncensorable, then no no amount of violence can get me, get my Bitcoin. So yeah. you have to come at me with something else other than violence. Maybe it's altruism. Yeah. So altruism becomes a skill that's you know learned more as a way to negotiate and get what you want in life instead of violence. You know, violence is demonetized. Love, peace, altruism, these are monetized. These are these are brought to the fore so that the, the complexion of society changes fundamentally, robustly. It's a very, very different and we see it in El Salvador. I mean El Salvador, I think, because since Bitcoin is legal tender, it doesn't really matter what percentage of the population is using Bitcoin on a day-to-day basis. The fact that the entire population is aware of Bitcoin, is thinking about Bitcoin and sees the president who is clearly an enlightened leader, it changes the mood of the entire country. People come here saying, you know, they love it here because it's so positive and upbeat. And where they come from typically is, uh, you know, down. There's a big downer. Things are falling apart. And, yeah. and this is part of the transformation that we're seeing here. And Bitcoin is a very big part of that. Yeah. I just had a question that I, that I, that I lost, but I, I loved what you said about, um, oh yeah, so, sorry, the altruism, like it's zero sum game versus mutually beneficial game, right? And the ultimate example of zero sum game is I shoot you and I kill you, right? And I win and, and you lose. And I would agree that the altruism is in Bitcoin is, yeah, yes, to convince or at least show other people what Bitcoin could mean for them so that when they join, we both benefit. It's not me benefiting from that person joining. They are benefiting from me being in it and I'm benefiting, benefiting from them joining it and maybe adding value in you know whatever way they, they would do it. So... And and also like it's clearly not a Ponzi. I heard you say, you know, uh, I love this. You know, we don't want you to buy it. You know, like all the all the maximalists say, like please don't don't buy it because then there's less uh, for me. You know, so I, I I think that that was a great argument for why Bitcoin is not a Ponzi. But I right. wanted to toxic, ask you, toxic maximalism yeah. is kind of you never find in a Ponzi scheme. Ponzi schemes are always by very good salespeople, slick people with a great patter, a great pitch and <laughs> get into my Ponzi scheme. But more, you know, fundamentally would be that in a Ponzi scheme, by definition, there's an unlimited number of unbacked claims. Mm-hmm. As the Ponzi scheme grows, the number of claims grows with the Ponzi. That's what a Ponzi scheme is, right? So Charles Ponzi, who introduced this idea of selling these rare stamps to people who were getting a return based on new people coming in to buy these rare stamps, that was a a Ponzi scheme or a pyramid scheme based on an ever increasing number of claims on that, on those supposedly rare stamps. And eventually it collapses as they all do. So with Bitcoin, it's absolutely scarce. So by definition, an anti Ponzi scheme, it's the complete opposite of a Ponzi scheme. People confuse but people say that, well, you're only buying it because it's going higher and that's a Ponzi scheme. But that's that's wrong. That's not what a Ponzi scheme is. No. Um, it's, it's, it, it, they're mixing metaphors here. I mean, people yeah. do buy it because it's going higher because they're protecting themselves against a the fiat money that's losing purchasing power. Yes. You know, so you should, if you said, oh, you're just buying it because fiat money loses is losing its purchasing power. Okay, and that's the exact same statement as saying you're only buying it because it's going higher. Those two statements are identical. But for Mm -hmm. some reason, people choose to say the one where it's only going higher and they never use or very rarely say it's because fiat money is mathematically guaranteed to lose its purchasing power. Right. That's 
why people buy Bitcoin, whether they see it in that way or not. That's ultimately what is going on. Yeah. Well, they, they put it in a investment speculation bucket versus I'm literally saving the rewards that I already gathered. So it won't be programmatically debased. You know, that that's obviously a totally different thing, but, but people are still in this investment corner uh, yeah. uh, talk. Well, you know. the language of Bitcoin has always been horrible. You know, it's when you talk about Bitcoin mining, it's like, is that really the right word to use in this case? Mm -hmm. It's very, very weird. You talk about, um, it's just every bit of the nomenclature of Bitcoin is awful. Like no one's ever written an actually good book about Bitcoin <laughs> that kind of cuts through all the horrible vocabulary, which came because you know, for 20 years, you know, there's a concept in software of kluge, kluge, where it's like just shitty software built on top of shitty software. And it's not commented in any way. And you can never use it or, you know, send it to anyone to use because they would have to, it's not commented and it's unusable. And so with Bitcoin, the, the nomenclature built up out of the cypherpunks for 20 years. And so the vocabulary that erupted when it came in 2009 was just god awful. And it's been impossible really to communicate using the terms most used in Bitcoin. So, yeah. um, but that's the way it is. It's just, it's, it's, it's un, un, it's, can't change it at this point. And, um, but nevertheless, um, you know, it's frustrating because these ideas get mixed and matched, whether it's an investment or a divestment, because you're not investing in Bitcoin, you're divesting out of fiat money. Exactly. Yes. Right. It's not yeah. a Ponzi scheme. It's an anti Ponzi scheme. You know, it's, it's mathematically to guarantee to increase purchasing power. You're mathematically guaranteed to lose purchasing power. Those are verites. Those are absolutely true statements, but they're all without context because nobody uses vocabulary. It's part of the reason why we're in such a dire straits is because the English language has, it all is just, it's been destroyed through revisionism and propaganda by the moneyed interest who have increasingly more power because they can print more fiat money. So even our language is totally fiat in its, in its essence and worthless yeah. in many ways. I mean, I do a lot of time writing. I just write, I write my column, you know, in the, in the Bitcoin magazine and you know, it's, you just become aware as you write stuff, you just become aware of like, these words are so worthless at this point, you know, the words are crap. They've just been destroyed over the years. And I like, you know, and I lived in France for many years, you know, France, they use a lot less words in, in French, but they, they, it depends on how you pronounce them and what the context is. And they say it's the language of the woods in France, or it's the language of diplomacy, because mm. the same thing can mean different things, depending on context and depending on being in the, in the moment, being there at the moment. Yeah. Whereas in the U.S. and English is very, very extraordinarily technical to the point of being picayune and abstracted to the extent of being worthless. It's like people yeah. just say nothing. It's just a cacophony of worthless sounds. It's less communicative than our chimp ancestors from a million years ago were able to communicate more effectively. I would, yeah. I would posit than the average to, you know, human beings. They're just, we're lost, man. Bitcoin is that thread, you know, that's taking us out of the darkness, the fiat money, dark ages. So hopefully we'll get there in time. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you, you know, why, why do people still dismiss Bitcoin? But I think you just answered it. Like, it's not everyone will understand this. I would, I now think, no, right? Like, th and that is probably fine, you know. But yep. uh, and and but I think well, maybe in general that's always how it goes, right? Not everyone understands the same thing at the same um, level. But for example, like what is was clear for me is you know I'm pretty risk averse, and that is exactly why I Bitcoin and. I would assume you agree, but how can we help people understand like this thing? The, also what we just talked about, like more self-responsibility, you are in control of your own 
you know, future and your outlook on the future as compared to, you know, outsourcing it to whoever sitting on whatever seat, basically. I I don't think you can. I just think that, um, you know, there was, um, there were a bunch of bears on a, on a mountain, brown bears and black bears. And uh, there was there was a freak bear. He was all white. Then the ice age hit, and all the brown bears and the black bears gone. And there was only white bears. Mm. <laughs> you know, like everything is changing, and yep. you're either you're you're a freak that's going to be the right freak to survive, or you're not. It's just like it's a crack in time and space. Hmm. it's the titanic sunk people on the lifeboat some of them were good people some of them were shit people doesn't matter it's just pure luck of the draw a lot yeah. of it is luck and uh, I, I would agree yes right yeah. so um but that's there's nothing you can do about it you hmm. know uh that meteor that was flew over portugal maybe maybe it hit earth who knows you know we could have get hit by a meteor at any moment <laughs> yeah no, that's very true. Right? Yeah. It was, we don't know. All I know yeah. is that the only thing worth exploring is the now. Like, yes. how much more, how much deeper can I go into this moment? That's it. Yeah. Everything else. And with Bitcoin, the past is immutable and the future is mysterious. And that's yeah. unique. Nothing else is like it. Everything else well, is different. And so I am happy to be ever more interested in exploring the cosmic now yeah is that also what is it has been like your journey since uh, 1988 i think you I, I replied to a tweet asking you to come on and that tweet uh you, you in that tweet you shared about you know your weekly uh water fast <laughs> and that it, it was part of your spiritual journey since 88 yeah so that started after that 87 crash, <laughs> then, yeah. right? What got you started on that journey? Well, you know, I don't, I see, I don't want to be like getting into my story in AA before um, 88 when I got sober, right? So there's before, then there's during, and then there's what to look forward to. So mm. if you go to an AA meeting, you typically hear people's stories and they describe what it was like before you got sober. And so, you know, I would reserve that kind of narrative to an AA meeting, right? So, and, and this, this is like a different type of a format, but, and I don't, I don't think it's a great like format to get into like what happened before. It's it. I went clearly, as you point out, it was the eighties and I was on wall street and the, if you look at the movie, um, that Leonardo DiCaprio movie, mm. um, Wolf of, wall street. Wolf of wall street. Right. So that is that era, right? So it's an era of incredible excess. I mean, I yeah. wrote about it. If people are interested, I wrote a story for Bitcoin magazine called Buy Love, Sell Fear. And so mm. this really captures what life was, for me, was like before 1988. So I started on Wall Street in 82. So from 82 to 88. So it, it, that that story in, in the ma in the magazine really captures it. I, I guess it's really more of my point. I'd rather have somebody, I'd rather direct people to read that story because it's, I think it's a good thing to read. And I get, I really, I think, explore it a lot. I don't, you know, I don't, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I get you. It's, it's all fine. I just. You, you get into I, this uh, kind of this, um, this kind of, um, it just, bec the, I think the, with, with Bitcoin is so fundamentally revolutionary that it takes the whole process of spiritual discovery into a, just another quantum level where mm. all of those stories are now um, insignificant in their own, yeah. in, in, in a way. Not not for someone I, who's actually in recovery and going to meetings and things like that, but for 
but for this general conversation about spirituality, it's just that it happened. Like I came in and the, the program of spiritual recovery is a basically, um, as we've discussed, it's analogous to, to Bitcoin in that, you know, the, the fiat money essentially takes hold of you and you become addicted to fiat money. And in the same way, drugs and alcohol can really become, you know, you become addicted, you, you, you um, lose your, your way, right? And so how do you get back from that? Yeah. And in AA, it is, it's a decentralized spiritual recovery that takes religion out of it. Okay. It takes religion out of God, the same way that Bitcoin takes the state out of money. Like that's the, that's the point. That's the big point for me in the last two or three weeks that mm -hmm. I've been exploring and this decentralized spirituality. And as Bitcoin becomes more ubiquitous and used around the world and you separate states from money and you have individual sovereignty and you have unconfiscatable property, it, and you do have the escape hatch from the fiat money addiction, you know, I think it's going to bring about a really profound spiritual renaissance, you know, yes. and, and this is, this is where, this is where we're at. Like, that's my focus, you know, that's mm -hmm. my focus right now to just meditate on that, that moment that we're on. Yeah. And so you were, you were working already on on your own journey, right? And then you yeah. you discovered Bitcoin. How how did Bitcoin then accelerate that for you? Like, how did it change your mind and life? Well, it, it wasn't obvious to me that the AA connection until recently, um, because initially I thought in Bitcoin in terms of the technology that I was had invented back in 1996, the uh, virtual specialist technology, which is a patented technology it's a patented virtual currency trading system and virtual securities so that was part of when i was in los angeles running the hollywood stock exchange which was a startup at that time with a friend of mine and we um created this platform and we needed our own currency so i went out and i invented one so um, when I first heard about Bitcoin, it seemed to be a continuation of that story from the nineties. Like it was another chapter in virtual currency stories. But what I've come to understand recently is it's really just another chapter in my sober story. It really goes back mm -hmm. to 1988 is really the beginning of my Bitcoin story, the, the need to have a spiritual connection. And, and that's what I'm seeing now is that it's part of that part that story is the story that the main the main story and so there so i see bitcoin as that spiritual solution and beyond its technological and monetary properties it's uh, spiritual properties and um so that's how that took place yeah so i wanted to talk about uh, bukela and, and el salvador you are an advisor to him yep can you share what that looks like? Like, do you remind him not to sell every day or like what, uh, <laughs> what does that look like? <laughs> well, basically, uh, you know, from, from, in my case, it means making a lot of suggestions that never, that never get followed through on because they're too crazy essentially. So, mm. uh, but it's, uh, you know, there's, we, we, we uh, Stacy and I, um, often uh, chat it, it, informally with the president. It could be at a dinner, you know, we post photos and things of uh, the dinners that we have. And so this is, um, I think the first time we met, I really was very uh, talking a lot about um, how Bitcoin demonetizes violence and things like this. And um, so he found it very fascinating. And so he invited us to come, Max and Stacey to come to El Salvador and be, you know, and help with Bitcoin policy and help advise on Bitcoin. And so as far as the, uh, the positive attributes of Bitcoin are concerned, the president's already orange pilled. He's already was thinking about Bitcoin since he was mayor going back a number of years of uh, San Salvador. 
Uh, and then the other side, the other part of the, uh, the, the, the remit is to keep the shit coins out. Mm -hmm. So that's like a, a lot of work that goes into just like keeping shit coins out. We passed a new law, which says Bitcoin is money. Everything else is an unregistered security. And that helped us a lot. You know, we didn't have the Luna Celsius, any of those huge catastrophes from two years ago during the bear market. None of them came into uh, El Salvador because we're very, very aware of keeping everything out. That wasn't, that's just a big Bitcoin maximalism and the brand of Bitcoin maximalism and Bitcoin country is, is a fantastic brand. And there's no reason to sully that brand with the presence of any other project that may or may not, or may offer some small incremental benefit in some theoretical way. It doesn't make any sense to entertain that even for a second because the brand yep. of Bitcoin maximalism is incredibly powerful and it's attracting talent and capital and the diaspora and everyone's, you know, focused on El Salvador. So we don't feel we're losing anything by not, by being exclusive, you know, Bitcoin maximalism. And, and now we've been doing this for over two years. I think that has been, been shown to be true. I think, you know, that, that idea that Bitcoin maximalism should be the only really policy it's been proven to be a good policy. You know, there, there's been nothing but benefits really. Yeah. And um, so that's, that's part of it. Just like, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's just the day to day kind of, you know, as things are evolving, um, try to add value where you can. And um, the president just won a reelection. The inauguration is June 1st. And um, so I, I know there's a, there's a, the, he, the president is so far ahead of everybody else. You know, he's, he's already, figured, he's got a vision. <laughs> it's very rare that I've heard anyone make a suggestion that he's already not already had, you know, and he's doing something about it. He's yeah. extremely it's super interesting. Uh, incredible. Yeah. It's very interesting to hear also that, that he was thinking about Bitcoin before, because one of the things I wanted to ask you was like, you know, how much are you still helping him, you know, shape his mind? But it it no. sounds like he's already completely there. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he, he had uh, he was orange. He, he talked about when he was mayor of uh, San Salvador, he was talking about Bitcoin. And, you know, mm. I mean, it's in this part of the world, Central America. If you've read John Perkins book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, you know that. Central banks like the IMF and others like to think of Central America as their backyard. You know, it's under their influence. Yeah. And, if, you know, that's uh, not a pleasant thing to experience, you know, if you're living here. And um, so they do that with the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar is a cudgel, right? The U.S. dollar is an instrument of control. And if there's any way to escape the U.S. dollar, that's very appealing to countries that are being unfairly victimized by U.S. dollar global hegemony. And you see this all over the world. You see this now with the BRICS. The BRICS are now very aggressively disinvesting out of the U.S. dollar. China just dumped the biggest dump of dollars ever. Russia is obviously uh, building systems outside of the U.S. dollar. And Russia and China and Iran together are building systems outside of the U.S. dollar. The BRICS, which represent a bigger footprint GDP than the non-BRICS and have a bigger population than the non-BRICS. You know, it's becoming really the pendulum of economic um, power is swinging to the BRICS. And um, because that the dollar had been weaponized. And it, it became impractical. If the U.S. can uh, ban Iran from SWIFT, if the U.S. can seize Russian assets, dollar assets, you know, be, what's the point, right? You can just create your own um, yep. currencies. And I under, my understanding is that the BRICS will come up with a, a you know, a, a gold-backed currency or a commodity-backed currency. And that, you know, that we're in, a, we're in a period now moving away from the dollar. So the dollar, you know, that has 
terrible consequences for Americans because that means inflation will continue to race forward. You know, and if you look at the commodity charts, if you look at copper, if you look at the agricultural commodities like rice, you look at what happened to cocoa recently, coffee, lumber a couple of years ago, you know, all of these commodities are breaking out on the upside. And um, ex with the exception of oil, but that's a special situation. And um, this is telling you and telegraphing you that the U.S. dollar is losing its status as world reserve currency because all commodities post-World War II are priced in dollars. You know, if Japan wants to buy oil, they have to buy dollars first and then buy oil, right? Yep. This is the, what the Bretton Woods Agreement was all about is everything is – backed by the dollar. And then at that time, the dollar was backed by gold. And then in 1971, the connection was severed and you entered an all fiat world and all the worst um, tendencies of fiat money went on super drive. And um, now we're in 2024 and the rest of the world is saying enough is enough. We're, we're checking out of the US dollar. So that just means that everything in the US will be more expensive. And people will be fleeing the U.S. And they're already fleeing. And people are fleeing Canada. And Canada is so concerned about the number of people leaving, you know, that they're charging an exit tax or an exit fee now. Yeah, I saw that. Canada. so wild. So that'll yeah. be true in the U.S. too. I mean, you can't give away your passport easily. People say, how come you still have a U.S. passport? Well, ask Roger Ver. You know, it's it does if you can give turn in your u.s passport it doesn't mean you you aren't still not obligated to pay taxes for a number of years you still have to pay a huge exit tax you still you know it's it's it, it essentially you don't have, it's not an option you know the u.s the empire is global and there is no escape right um so again you know bitcoin is a ladder out of this madness and um this is a great place to, to, to come and, and experience economic freedom and a growing economy, leadership that's really supported by the population, does a great work for the population. And, um, and, and so th this, is, this is the place to come. I, you know, everyone should at least visit here, for come for a week or something, and just check it out and see what it's like. And I think you'll be very pleasantly surprised. Yeah. When I come, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, hit, I'll hit you up. <laughs> I, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about game theory. Um, I don't know if you know this, um, this viral video. You know, it's, it's an old video, but it's like uh, there's like people who are hanging out like on this grassy hill and there's like one guy dancing yeah. mm -hmm. and then one guy follows him and then like everyone starts dancing, right? I feel like Bukele is the guy who started dancing. You know, and and the, the entire point of that video, right? How people illustrate it is that not the person starting it, the crazy person starting it, is is the most important person. Actually, the first follower is the most important person because they mm -hmm. legitimize the crazy guy, right? And then the other people um, are confident enough to to join them as well. So I wanted to ask you, who do you think could be like a big first follower? Um, of Bukele, like uh, of course, you know n now more people know El Salvador, but in all honesty, it's not um, you know a big big enough country to make a splash. Like, do you have an idea of who could be a first serious follower? Well, and I should uh, I think we should think about wrapping this up soon because I've been talking <laughs> now for a long time and I'm starting to you know fade a bit. Um, okay. So maybe we can wrap this up after this one uh, <laughs> because, you know, I am going to be, I'm 64 years old, you know, and uh, I just don't have the stamina that I had. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, the longer it takes, the better, Bram, because we're getting all the talent that's coming here. Hmm. So this is like the only option. So we're getting the best and the brightest. So whoever is number two, take your time because uh, we'll, we'll take all the talents coming here. And uh, this is becoming a really um, a phenomenal, attractive place for this, the best and the brightest. So whoever number two is, yeah, good luck, but take your time because we're, we're benefiting hugely by with this first mover advantage. Thank you. All right. We're, we're, we're going to see how it goes. All right. We'll skip to the last question that I ask <laughs> everyone. And it's the same question. 
What's a core belief you will never let go? Love. Good ending, man. Thanks so much for your time. And uh, I appreciate it. And um, yeah, man, wish you all the best. Thank and, you so uh, much. Thanks. It was great to see you. And um, I hope to uh, be in, in the Netherlands uh, again before too long. It's a fantastic uh, place, beautiful place with a great, great people. Uh, uh, the Dutch people are fantastic people. And um, hope to be back soon. Cheers, man. I'll see you then. Bye. Cool. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye. 